Welcome to uh, Early American History. I'm Dr. Richard Gardner, Associate Professor of History Education from Columbus State University. In this course, we're gonna be discussing American history from the time of Columbus until about just after the American Civil War. But before we begin to do history, we have to understand the historical method. That means the way in which historians go about finding out about history, about what happened and why. And the historical method differs significantly from what's known as the scientific method. And what I wanna do here at the beginning is to help us distinguish between the scientific method and the historical method. So let's start with the scientific method. Now the scientific method involves the ability and the necessity to repeat an event. So say for example, we're trying to discover what is the freezing point of water. We can do this through the scientific method. We take water, place it in a, some kind of container, put it under certain degrees of temperature and measure it and find out at what temperature the water freezes. We can repeat that. We can do it again and again and again and again. And every time we do it, it seems we discover that the water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius, and we come up with a proposition, a fact as it were, a scientific fact based on induction that water freezes at 32 degrees. And we can demonstrate that again and again and again. Now the historical method is not quite as easy. The main reason being that we can't repeat a historical event. History has passed, it's gone, uh, and as of yet, we have not uh, invented a time machine where we can actually go back and watch what happened. So what we have is evidence. We have the residue of what happened, and we collect that evidence, we interpret the evidence, and then we draw conclusions from the evidence. The principal evidence that historians have used to uh, come up with their conclusions is documentation, texts writings, sometimes writings of historians of the past who have said, here's what happened and here's why it happened. Those are the, the most important documents perhaps we have as historians, are written texts from the past. But we also have artifacts, we have things, we have clothes, we have uh, pottery, we have things that we can draw inferences from. Uh, these are items of history. We have buttons, we have uh, political buttons, for example, would be an artifact to tell us something about what happened in a particular political uh, climate in the past. When we're talking about recent history, we also have memory, personal memory, personal testimony. If we're studying, for example, the history of 9-11, the attacks on 9-11, there are many people, including myself, still alive today, who can tell us about uh, what happened simply by remembering it. We experienced it, we, we saw it, we, we took part in that event, and our memory becomes an important piece of the evidence to make our conclusions. Uh, and we also have uh, recordings, especially since the time of Edison. We have audio recordings, we have video recordings. We would also probably consider something like a photograph to be a recording, even a painting which goes way back to the ancient time, uh, is some degree of a recording. The engravings that we see the, uh, on Egyptian uh, pyramids, things of that nature, those are recordings. Uh, they're not necessarily texts, but they're, they're recordings of images, things of that nature. So those are the principal pieces of evidence that we use to determine what happened and why. We also have what we would call indirect evidence. These are more like clues rather than it is absolute evidence. Uh, for example, how about names? Think about a family who was, we're studying a family in New England in the year 1645. And we see that they have named their sons and daughters something like uh, Abigail and uh, Hezekiah and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Well, we can perhaps uh, derive from that that this family has a great deal of respect for the Old Testament in the Bible. Why? Because they've named all of their children Old Testament names. Now, is that a guarantee? No, it's a piece of evidence. It's evidence that we gather to make a conclusion. 
We can also look at what words people use. For example, if you're looking at a collection of letters written by a certain person, and then you have another letter over here and you're not sure who wrote this letter, one of the things you might look at is the word choices, the, the, the vocabulary of a particular person, and you compare it to the other letters, and perhaps that gives you some evidence as to who is the author of this letter. Of course, when you're dealing with letters, one of the other pieces of uh, indirect evidence is the handwriting. We have people in our craft who are experts at handwriting, can tell you whether or not this is the authentic signature of John Hancock or whether it's a forgery. We also need to look at the, when we're looking at a document, look at the genre of the document. It's sometimes uh, easy for historians to con uh, confuse a his piece of history, a narrative of history, and a mythological narrative or a piece of fiction. Did the author of this piece intend for it to be interpreted as, as what happened exactly, or is it more of a fable, more of a, a myth or a tale? So we have to look at the, the genre of the evidence as well. And then we get to the process of interpretation. The historian looks at evidence, and we, we, we try to evaluate the integrity of the evidence. Is this authentic? And the way we establish its authenticity is we look at its transmission, something we call the provenance. The, it came from here, and then it was passed to here, and to here, and to here. Is there a clear provenance uh, of the evidence? Is the source reliable? Is the source biased that we're reading right here? And then what we do is, as historians, we attempt to provide conclusions. We tr attempt to provide explanations. Some people might use the word fact. Let, what is a historical fact? Well, it's, it's always a little bit uh, tenuous when we use the word fact, but a historical fact would mean a proposition about the past that's supported by virtually indisputable evidence. So I would say, for example, that the fact that Abraham Lincoln was a president of the United States is a fact. Why is it a fact? Because the evidence is virtually indisputable. And we always have somebody who uh, is this outlier who claims that, well, how do you know that the aliens, this, that, and the other? Well, the, the evidence is virtually indisputable. That's not always the case with a lot of history. A lot of times we make historical what we call thesis. A thesis is, well, here's my interpretation of the evidence. The evidence seems to suggest that such and such happened. That would be a historical thesis. And that's the fun of history, is coming up with theses, coming up with a, a suggestion, a hypothesis. Here's what I think the evidence suggests. And that's what we're going to be doing as we go through this course, looking at evidence, interpreting it, and coming forth with some conclusions, maybe some facts, but a whole lot of theses that perhaps we can, uh, we can argue and debate as we go along.